This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show, where you know it, we celebrate the role players, the underdogs, and the great stories in sports. And our Moonlighter for today is a guy that really exemplifies Iowa Hawkeye football. He spent five years in the Iowa Hawkeye program. He was a walk-on. He came in as a linebacker, changed positions, became a fullback. And, of course, the Hawkeyes are one of the, the only teams left in college football that are still utilizing the fullback heavily. In his four years as the starting fullback at Iowa, he carried the ball 13 times, had 25 total yards, did score a touchdown, also caught seven passes out of the backfield for 43 yards. So just really selfless, team before me, Always blocking, never going to have your name in the box score type of guy. Perfect for the Moonlight Graham Show. His name is Brady Ross. Now, Brady Ross, you know, if you follow Iowa Hawkeye football or Big Ten football, you've probably seen Brady Ross's name out there. He was featured on Barstool once as the football guy of the week, and he really exemplifies, you know, the, the Hawkeye fullback has really come to exemplify like everything that Hawkeye football is. And I had heard from a number of different people that you should have Brett Brady Ross on the podcast because he's a great interview. And naturally, when I'm hearing you should have Brady Ross on the podcast, Iowa Hawkeye fullback, I'm thinking like he must be a meathead with great stories. Now, without ever having met Brady before, that's kind of what I was thinking heading into this interview, right? Iowa Hawkeye fullback from small town Iowa. Uh, the guy you would just assume if somebody's telling you he's got he's a great interview, we must be one of those like you know football bros that is just a really fun times, great to have on the podcast, that type of thing. And what you get from this interview is anything but that. Now it's a great interview. It it really is a great interview, and Brady Ross is a great interview, but he is not the football meathead guy that maybe I was expecting when I'm interviewing a Hawkeye fullback. What you get out of Brady Ross is a very measured, intelligent, really smart conversation, which was a pleasant surprise for me. And now I had heard the the people. Now, granted, the people that had told me Brady Ross is a good interview are also pretty sharp, intelligent guys. You know, because they're from North Central Iowa. Brady Ross is from Humboldt, Iowa. Iowa, not far from Fort Dodge. So if you're not far from Fort Dodge, you're, you're you know bound to be a pretty sharp, intelligent individual. So I was expecting, you know, I was not expecting a full meathead out of Brady, but what I got was a really uh, interesting conversation. And the reason why I wanted to have a Hawkeye football player on this week and, and really why I sought out Brady as a guy that spent four years in that Iowa offense, you know, coming into this week, not knowing what was going to happen with Brian Ferentz, I really wanted somebody that I thought would go to bat for the Hawkeye football program, would go to bat for the Ferences. Because, of course, we've heard about all the fans, we've heard all the commentators that continue to complain about everything that's going wrong with Hawkeye football. But I thought it might be interesting to hear from a Moonlighter, to hear from an underdog, and tell us the inside story, the thing that we as idiot fans are missing. And that's really what I wanted to get out of Brady Ross. And I thought I really got a great, honest interview from him here on the pod. And and as I look at his numbers, as I interviewed him, I'm really glad that we got Brady on because he is a true definition of that underdog, of the walk-on, of everything we're trying to do here on the Moonlight Graham Show. And I think you guys will really enjoy this episode. It would have been interesting, you know, to have even more interesting probably to have the interview after Brian Ferentz and everything that's happened with him on Monday. I'm recording this intro on Monday, but I did the interview with Brady on Friday, not knowing what was ahead, but I don't think that maybe would have changed the interview all too much. Either way, I think you guys are going to enjoy it. So thank you guys for subscribing to the podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode. As always, if you're following us on social media, thank you. If you're subscribed to us on on you know the podcast platforms thank you if you're not we would love if you subscribed we'd love it if you gave us a five-star review that does help so uh thanks for all that you do and following the podcast and enjoy today's episode with moonlighter brady ross moonlighters are you or someone you know moving down to kansas city well if you are the one realtor that we trust and yet you need to be calling is the great brian sandvig As you well know, Brian Sandvig is our producer here on the podcast, and there is not a better residential real estate advisor down in the Kansas City marketplace than Brian Sandvig. 
call Brian Sandvig, shoot him a text. Hey, DM us on social media. We'll get you connected with Brian if you can't find him on all the socials, but he is there and he is active and he is your Kansas City realtor. So give him a call. All right, so Brady Ross, before we started recording, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, North Central Iowa, where you and I both, uh, we hail from. Humboldt, Iowa has had, you know, a, a long list of legendary Iowa athletes come out of Humboldt, Iowa. Where do you think, Brady, you rank as as, as far as greatest athletes from Humboldt ever? <laughs> uh, certainly nowhere near the top. Um it wasn't a question I was anticipating, but I, did really not prep, I don't think I, not I don't. For this. I don't think I don't think I was. I've ever been asked that, but uh, I grew up uh, like we were talking beforehand, um, uh, watching Tyler Nielsen, uh, Cody Hunter, Mark. Even before them, uh, Michael Loney was a basketball player uh, oh, yeah. that I remember. I, I was very, very young uh, at that point, but but yeah, I. Uh, I'll never see myself in, in that category. Um, I just never will, I'm sure. I mean, I've heard others um, try to rank me and stuff, but that's not really something that I'm too uh, too interested in doing, <laughs> to be honest, because who knows? Are you in the top 25? I I, I have no idea. You know, you, you look at all sports. I mean, there, there have been some impressive athletes. Um, you know, we have uh, a girl right now running uh, cross-country, at the University of Iowa, Bryce Goodell, and she was extremely impressive. Um, you know, just looking at some of her times because I got into 5K running a little bit a couple couple uh, summers ago, and I could never touch any of those times. So she's probably ahead of me. Like I said, the the other people I just mentioned certainly ahead of me. Quentin Orr right now is also a, a distance runner at Iowa State, and he's him, he's having man. a really really good career. In fact, I think uh, last I checked, he's I mean he's competing for wins at that level and yeah you know you go back way back you know, I guess decades back you know Bruce Reimers was um, played in the Super Bowl uh, for the Cincinnati Bengals uh, and then you hear you hear all kind of folk stories about guys that didn't play at the next level guys and gals that didn't play uh, in college but could have would have should have sort of thing in a different day and age um, oh yeah I mean, that's kind of, frankly, what this podcast kind of is about, right, is, you know, the stories, the untold stories in sports. And, and you know, there are there are literally millions of people out there that that claim to have more talent. Some of them did have more talent, but it's very few that actually, you know, got to experience what you experienced on September 28th of 2019, where you get the handoff in Kinnick Stadium and plunge into the end zone for a touchdown. You know, very few people, Brady, I know you're trying to be humble here, but very few people have experienced scoring a Division I touchdown in Kinnick Stadium. What did that feel like? As a guy, selfless guy, playing a selfless position like fullback, what did it feel like to score a touchdown, you know, in Saturday in a great stadium like Kinnick? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I uh, it's kind of interesting you bring that up because I – I don't know if you've heard of Barstool Sports. They have a they have this award that they give out for the low football man guy of well that, that but football guy of the week. And I haven't thought of this in years, but I actually won football guy of the week that week. <laughs> I uh, did not know of, that because, because of report. Yeah, I was like between me, Andy Reid, and some other guy, and I guess I got the votes, which I don't understand, but. Because a reporter asked me the same question you just did after the game, and I kind of answered with, honest to God, the truth, you know, I, I was happier with some of the blocks that I threw that game than the one-yard plunge because in reality, like, that's – the degree of difficulty there isn't that high, to be honest. I mean, we were playing Middle Tennessee State, and we had the ball on the one-yard line, and, you know, we had some big boys up front that did all the work, and all I had to do is trip forward for a yard – but, you know, blocking Division One linebackers, defensive ends, and safeties out in space, that's that's a heck of a lot tougher, at least for me, um, you know, than falling forward for a yard. So I was I was happier with some of that stuff, frankly. Um, but, yeah, certainly cool to, to think about, um, you know, scoring a touchdown or at least getting, getting your name in the box score there at that level because you grow up, you know, dreaming of that sort of thing um, without a doubt. So... 
So take me back to when you were in high school and you were playing for Humboldt. You know, you're you're an all state linebacker and running back at that point. Was was it always Iowa that you wanted to play for when you were in high school? Yeah, so um, it kind of evolved a little bit. I, I started, I kind of under realized that well, I actually played a lot of AAU traveling basketball through middle school, and I did excel uh, at basketball at that age. But um, you know, you, you kind of saw the writing on the wall. You know, my dad was five foot ten, uh, my mom is five foot seven, and you know, I was already taller than both of them <laughs> in eighth grade, and no brother over five ten. Uh, and, and I didn't shoot threes and didn't really handle the ball in the backcourts. So how that translates to the next level on the basketball court, you know, it isn't, isn't very good to put it one way. Uh, so you, you kind of saw it on the wall that it was, it was going to be football if I wanted to see how far I could go in athletics and was a Hawkeye fan uh, really from a young age. But it's funny, once you get into that position where, you do start to achieve some of the things that you mentioned and you, you do have some eyeballs uh, at the next level start to start to go towards you a little bit there and, and have conversations, you know, you, your options kind of open a little bit, or at least in mine, uh, my case, because, um, you, you know, in my situation, I was not highly recruited. Uh, I was one of those guys from small town Iowa that, you know, dominated on Friday nights against other small town Iowa teams. But again, you know, similar to the basketball point, there were some questions on how I would um, translate uh, to the next level. Uh, Cause I'm not six foot three. I, I never did run a four foot 4.4 second 40, like Tyler Nielsen and some of the other guys that we talked about before. So really you get into a situation where you, you really just want to go wherever you're wanted. You know, you know, you want to go uh, to a place. Certainly, in my case, I wanted to play Division One. I. I never wanted to leave that stone unturned um, and, and wonder if I could have done it. Um, but quite frankly, there was a long time period there where none of the Division One programs thought I could do it. Uh, so there wasn't, you know, there was some wishy-washy interest. And, you know, Iowa State wanted me to, to come walk on. Iowa wanted me to come walk on. There were times in the process where I was pretty sure Iowa state was actually going to offer me. Uh, and that was under the Paul Rose regime. Didn't quite decide to do so. And, but yeah, so a long winded way of saying that, yes, I was a Iowa fan growing up, but when you're in that uh, position where it's uh, actually time to look for a place to call home for five years, your, your, your vision kind of widens, especially when you're wondering who actually wants you and who's going to give you a chance to succeed. Was the decision, like, once you got an offer from Iowa, was it as simple as, like, well, I got the offer from Iowa. I'm an Iowa fan. That's where I'm going to go. Or were there, was there more thought in it from your standpoint because of the development that – the track record of development that Iowa has with taking Iowa kids from small-town Iowa and turning them into big-time college football players and a lot of them into NFL players – was that part of the decision too, or was it as simple as like, oh, my favorite college gave me a scholarship offer. That's where I'm going to go. Uh, so out of high school, they did not give me a scholarship. Uh, okay. I started my career as a walk-on. Um, and then after my, uh, after my red shirt freshman year, I was told in my camp, that's actually a interesting story, but I was told in my second camp, you know, the camp leading up to where, I was actually going to play on the field as a as a second year freshman, if you will, uh, at fullback uh, that I would be put on scholarship at the end of the semester. So it happened quicker than I ever imagined it would. I'm certainly very happy about that. And so so was my bank account, uh, of course. Um, Did they do one of those cool scholarship presentations no. for you? No, no, no they, they don't media. do that. And, and that's one of the things about Iowa is like, you, you know, you ask some of the you know upperclassmen you know, if you if, if you put a gun to their head and, and told them to tell you who the walk-ons were and who the scholarship guys were. I mean, there are always a couple that you you know, you know. <laughs> but no, I mean everyone's treated the same. Nobody really. I mean, a lot of people don't even know, um, you know, who's on scholarship and who's not. But but no, so I, I was not offered a scholarship uh, out of co out of high school to Iowa, Iowa State, or UNI for that matter, which. That's a different conversation too. 
Um, but I was offered from um, a few high, relatively high level division two programs that I have a lot of respect for um, Northwest Missouri state uh, gave me a nice offer. Uh, Minnesota state and Mankato uh, offered me and uh, you know, telling those schools, no, uh, um, you guys actually want me, but I'm actually going to go over here where in my mind, they didn't want me. And when that was a big chip on my shoulder uh, entering my career at Iowa, uh, I actually, I remember having some emotions when I, was having that conversation with with Mankato State because it's uh it's just uh you know, you're very fortunate you're very appreciative of that offer you're very appreciative of the fact that they do care enough to uh, to extend you something of substance um, and there's almost a, a feeling of guilt that you're um, not going to take it and that you're going to go walk on elsewhere but like I said I didn't want the stone to be unturned I didn't want to wonder what if but no it had Iowa State offered me a scholarship and I had Iowa just offered me the walk-on opportunity, um, I would have gone to Iowa State. Um, and there is no there is no question about that. Again, I at that point um, you know, in my life, I, I really just wanted to go where they wanted me the most. And you know, obviously, a walk-on at Iowa and a walk-on at Iowa State, I'm not going to walk on at Iowa State, you know, all else equal. But, but yeah, so that's a long-winded answer again. I apologize for that. But, but yes, um, that's where it was. And I'm assuming you go to Iowa with the thoughts of being a linebacker, right? And and if Iowa State would have offered you or that they wanted you as a walk-on, probably as a linebacker, because I don't think Iowa State uses the fullback much. <laughs> Iowa, of course, is kind of famous for continuing to use the fullback. But were your hopes to turn into, you know, the next, I guess, Josie Jewell was probably there at the same time. But but is that was kind of your mindset is like me and Josie Jewell are competing for the same spot? So, yeah, it played into it, certainly. You know, I I came into Iowa as a linebacker, and I did a, did a pretty good job early, early, early in my career. I was, the, I was on the same scout team with all the other scholarship linebackers, and I, I won scout team defensive player of the year uh, that year as a true freshman at linebacker. Um, I think I, I could have played linebacker at Iowa at the Big Ten level, I do not believe that I have um, the tools to be a consensus all American like like Josie was or like a Jack Campbell. I, I don't. Uh, I'm under no delusions of grandeur that 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 would have been me. <laughs> I think my ceiling. I think my ceiling at the linebacker position was lower than theirs. There's no question about that. But as I alluded to earlier, I was a walk on. So I immediately and I'm a and now today I'm a financial advisor and my whole life I've. I've been very aware, been very financially savvy and uh, aware of all that stuff. And the fact that I knew every semester I spend not contributing to this team on Saturdays in Kinnick Stadium, A, you're burning precious time because you only get so long uh, to play for the Hawks. And B, you're, you're burning money. You're taking out student loans to be here uh, in the grind. And push prowlers until you throw up, and and wake up and go to practice at five thirty in the morning. And you're not getting you're not getting anything in return, quite frankly. You know, so I knew that I needed to find the you know the path of least resistance to the field. And as you mentioned earlier, there was a guy named Josie Jewell, which you know, sort of dictated that path of least resistance was not at the Mike linebacker position. He could have broke both of his legs and he'd still probably uh, <laughs> be a better Mike linebacker than I. Um, and then that's another position where, you know, you're, they're bringing in guys every single year. Uh, the competition is high and, um, you know, it, it's uh, it was sort of a smarter, not harder, work smarter, not harder decision. And I started to, you know, in hindsight, it would have made more sense just to have a conversation with, with the head man about, making a position change, but they, they initially wanted me as a linebacker and they brought in a fullback, you know, uh, in our class as a walk on too. So that was an obstacle. There was a couple fullbacks on the roster older than I, but um, yeah, I, I should have probably just had a conversation with, with the head guy about it and, uh, or coach Doyle and saw, and saw what they thought about that. But instead I, I opted to purposely, um, Way in heavy. 
uh, just get really, really big and strong and, and pretty much to the point where um, uh, I couldn't play linebacker because I was essentially a, a third offensive guard uh, body type wise and <laughs> sort of quote unquote grow in, into the fullback position and kind of help them out a little bit, you know, so, so comments were being made throughout the course of the year that, you know, that year we had Adam Cox and Macon Plubba who were going to graduate. Drake Kulik was going to move up and kind of be the heir apparent at fullback, but there were some jokes and quips being made about me switching to, to fullback. Um, and at Iowa, if you work hard on, on scout team, if you work hard, everything you do is uh, certainly evaluated. In the, whether it's in the classroom, in the meeting room, uh, on the field, in, in the weight room, um, they want to find a spot for you on Saturdays. And for me, that spot was was fullback. So hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, you mentioned Coach Doyle there. So, you know, the legendary kind of Coach Doyle fitness program. Were you there like during the Rabdo stuff? And what, what was that like? Just what were his workouts like? I don't think anybody that wasn't in the program can really know what, what it's like, the intensity and the, the demands of a college football weight program. What was that like with Doyle? The Rabdo um, event was well before me. That was, uh, I believe, Tyler Nielsen and, and Cody Huntermark were okay. there. You know, so, I mean, shoot, this would have been – Years, several years before me, but um, yeah, that, I've heard stories of that workout. Uh, yikes! But yeah, I mean, uh, it's tough. You know, it, it is tough. But at the end of the day, that you're, that's what you're there for, and um, you're student athlete in name only. Kind of, I mean, you need to take care of yourself on the field, off the field, especially if you're like me and, and don't have just like an abundance of God-given talent. You know, I, you know, some of the guys that I was there with, you know, Worfs and some of those guys could kind of do whatever they wanted the night before, roll out of bed and knock down stations and 60s and quarters and, or, you know, whatever conditioning prowlers we, we had that day uh, with, with very little uh, issue. But for, for most of us mere mortals, you, you definitely had to take care of yourself uh, in the recovery room and certainly nutritionally and all that stuff to make sure that you could you could make the grade when uh, when the bullets start flying. Because, yeah, we had some tough ones. What was – yeah, give me, give me one that you dreaded. Yeah, so uh, one of them was uh, in the summer we would – so first of all, the, the speed work we would do before going into the weight room was about 45 minutes long. And that was sprinting and pulling things and heavy sweating and breathing. Then you went in and lifted. And that was usually a pretty grueling lift. And then after the lift, uh, you went out and conditioned. Oh, and uh, we went through blocks of um, what we call GPP, which is uh, some of the listeners may be you know, familiar uh, concept of general physical preparedness. So things like lifting sandbags and carrying them, pushing heavy prowlers, uh, uh, which are sleds, pushing sleds um, as fast as we can, um, you know, things like that, slide board, stuff like that. I always did relatively well with that because I, I was probably stronger than I was, you know, agile or, you know, conditioned in the running space, certainly at 265 pounds, but at 5'11". <laughs> but uh, one of the toughest, um, one of the toughest conditionings I thought was always the stations and 60s. So 60 yard shuttles after going through stations uh, where you're we wearing a weighted vest and the stations are, you know, running in and out of bags, chasing each other, you, you, you know, uh, doing like a bracket drill on a punt return, you know, just stations, blow the whistle, go to the next station, blow the whistle, go to the next station. And definitely didn't want to be, I learned early, you didn't want to be in the 930 group. That was the latest group uh, for stations in 60s uh, for two reasons. One, uh, it was about 12 degrees hotter than the first group uh, in the summer. Uh, first group being at six o'clock. And, and the second reason being, 
the the uh, the weighted vest you put on had about another eight pounds in it. Uh, somebody else's was... sweat, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, so so yeah, that that was probably my the one of them that I was happy um, happy when it was over. But I Let never ask... missed the conditioning time at Iowa, which I still just I can't believe. I just that seems shocking to me in hindsight. That might yeah, be it's... my greatest. <laughs> that might be my greatest achievement. <laughs> Let me ask you this and be honest. Do you think that what you guys were doing at Iowa, it, just because I'm, I'm curious as to how every program probably thinks that they work the har harder than anyone else. Do you think you guys actually were working harder than everyone else? Or do you think it's literally just, you know, what you as an individual put in is what you are going to get out and every program is going to have certain individuals that are putting in more than everybody else. No, I, I don't, I don't know about it, it in terms of like uh, the conditioning work and all that stuff. You know, I, I always have kind of the bias that everybody's working hard. Now, granted I was up you know, um, early and all, all the way through my high school career running Gunder Hill at five 30 in the morning until we were borderline throwing up in high school. So um, in hindsight, I know that that's probably not normal. That probably isn't what most high schoolers are doing. But in, in the moment, um, I always felt like there was someone out there working harder than me. You know, I thought the guys in Webster City or, you know, Algona or, or wherever were, were doing the same stuff. And if I wasn't doing it, I was going to fall behind. And, and that carries over to college, except for the, the other guys probably are doing it. Um, but, but I have no idea in terms of the conditioning and the, the speed work and the, the lifting stuff. Um, I, I'd say when I went through there, there was a lot more of a work, work smarter, not harder um, mentality coming, coming up through the zeitgeist. Now I, we still work plenty hard. Don't get me wrong, but you know, things like GPS units where um, we're literally tracking guys, high speed movement. And in making sure that, you know, we're not overworking guys to the point of, you know, where they can't recover um, because that doesn't do anybody any good. Um, you know, wearing, you know, we wore uh, one thing I'm, I am very sure that no one else was doing because at the time it was just us. And I believe one NFL team that was doing this, but we wore bands around our wrists 24 seven. Uh, that told the strength and conditioning staff how much sleep we got. Uh, if we got up to take a leak at two in the morning, uh, they knew it. Um, you know, so they had all of that data. It wasn't getting away with much. Um, we took uh, heart rate variability tests every morning. Um, we all had an iPad, and that literally was like one of the only reasons that and watching film that we had a, a team-issued iPad uh, to check our HRV numbers and make sure everyone was recovering. Um, so, so we worked hard, but I don't want to make it sound like an uphill both ways. Like we, we weren't training for the seals <laughs> or anything like that. Right. Uh, but no, I, I think a lot of people try to make it sound like they, they're a little bit tougher than they actually are. <laughs> Cause you know, like I said, I didn't miss any, I didn't miss any uh, speed times and I'm far from a genetic phenom. So if I can do it, I'm not going to say anybody can do it, but it, it wasn't all that incredibly difficult. In the Let me ask you this. As an ex Iowa player, and you were a guy that, you know, played kind of like a Kirk Ferentz position, right? The fullback job at Iowa, you know, which, you know, has been celebrated on Barstool and the low man and, you know, Monty Potty, Potty Bomb and, and all this stuff, right? Now you see the criticism that Kirk and Brian and the football program are taking, even as they continue to win, you know, the vast majority of their games. How do you feel as an ex-player about, you know, the, the public criticism, especially on social media, that a lot of, you know, folks are, are raining down on the Hawk program week in, week, week out right now? Um, you know, the first thing I'll say is I, I've, like I said, I think we mentioned at the outset, I've been an Iowa fan pretty much my whole life. And um, the, the fact is there's always been a very, if not majority, a very significant portion of the fan base who, who wasn't very happy with 
whoever the offensive coordinator has been ever, ever since Ken O'Keefe, um, you know, under, oh, that, under that statement parents. is so true. Brady. I'm, I'm, I'm literally laughing yeah. at because, you know, that I, and, I'm laughing because an ex Hawk player is actually acknowledging it. Right. Well, yeah. And I, I was an Iowa, you know, through and through since I was a little, little kid, you know, I, I remember games from, you know, decade and a half ago, you know, and I, and I, like I, I was at some of those games, you know, so like when, when Ken O'Keefe came back to be, uh, to help, you know, he was a quarterback's coach. Um, he was an offensive coach for us there. Um, when Brian made the transition to uh, offensive coordinator, I was like starstruck. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't believe, oh my gosh, this is Ken O'Keefe. This is awesome. You know, no one else even knew who the guy was, you know, but, um, but I digress on that stuff. And the point being is, you know, it's always been um, kind of a, a majority opinion or, or prevalent opinion out there that we need to do something uh, different, whether it's um, stylistically or personnel wise on the offensive staff. So that that's not new. I, I will say, I also don't want to be one of those guys that gets on a podcast like this, uh, you know, and I don't know about one of those guys, I can't name anyone else who does this, but I don't want to gaslight, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and act like people are just completely out of bounds for critiquing the offense. I mean, at the end of the day, that is what college, makes college sports so awesome is the passion right. of the fans, right. you know, and, and, and let's be fair. I mean, it, it, it has been really bad lately. Um, and, and look, I'm not going to say like we weren't the 07 Patriots when I was there. Again, we, we never have been. Uh, the offensive philosophy that we have is very different in the fact that we could be really good and we're still not going to be anywhere near the top uh, of the country in terms of a lot of the mainstream statistics like total yards. ER and points and things like that. We just That's just not the way we – that's not the game we play on that side of the ball. Um, but, yeah, again, giving the devil their due, I mean, it it, it does need to get better. And, and I think that the offensive staff will be the first to admit that. You know, I, I know Brian pretty darn well. I've had a lot of conversations with him, um, long conversations that covered more than football. I, I know how he thinks uh, better than most. And – I, I can tell you that uh, you know, he probably agrees with a lot of the criticism. Quite frankly, I mean, it, it does need to get better, and you know, I don't, I don't think it does anyone any favors to act, act like it, like it doesn't. But you know, some of that goes without saying. I think it's been, it's been, they've been had some challenges on that side of the ball, certainly. Right. But they're, so you they're acknowledge, out, so. yeah, obviously you acknowledge that. Like th- things need to get better, and it's, it's not all. You know, it, it's not falling on deaf ears, and and everybody, even p- people within the program, know that like there's improvement that needs to happen. What is one thing that the the fans just miss or just don't get though? Like for as much as the criticism sometimes can be warranted, what's one thing, at least from your vantage point, that the the fan base and the criticism is missing? Well, you know, I, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, and what I never want to come across uh, as, you know, whether I'm talking with, uh, you know, a client about the, the capital markets or, you know, personal finance, or I'm talking to a quote unquote f- football casual or, or somebody like that um, who, who doesn't have a PhD in football like I do, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, right, right. I never exactly. want to come across. I never want to come across as the guy who's like looking down my nose and, you know, holier than thou, you know, look how smart I am. You don't know anything. You, you know, you layman. Uh, no, I never want to come across that way. But, but, you know, but at like, the same th- time, there are, like when you're in a program yeah. and you're watching the film and breaking it down in the way that people on the team and the coaches do, which you have experience with, you are seeing things at a different level than the average fan that's watching for, you know, three hours every Saturday on the Big Ten Network. It's just a different level of understanding of the game. 
and I'll be the first to admit, yeah. like I never played high level football. Like I, there's a lot of things that I, I oversimplify. And I think many of us do because we don't understand kind of the million whys behind it. And so I, I got to imagine there's a few things, regardless of how warranted some of the criticism is, there's a few things that just the fan base has oversimplified in the criticism. Sure. And, and I would say that in these last, last couple of years, I, I, I'll say like it, it has genuinely not been good offensively, you know, so I, I'm not, and, and it probably is pretty much as bad as, as a lot of people. I mean, that's, it kills me to say that, but I mean, it's, it, it kind of is that simple in some regards, but what, one thing I would say is just the understanding that, Offensive football, successful offensive football can look very different uh, depending on your holistic philosophy as a team. Um, what do you mean by that? I'll give you an example. And I'll give you an example. So um, the late, great Mike Leach. Oh, yeah. For example. Uh, they could have had gone out there, played an incredibly inefficient game offensively where they're putting balls on the ground, they're throwing interceptions, they're turning the ball over. Um, You know, they're not – the offensive unit is a net negative to the team uh, in their pursuit of, of winning the football game. And they could have scored 42 points. The pace at which they play, the sheer number of plays that they run, the style of offense where they're pushing the ball down the field, they're swinging for the fences, um, makes it such that even an unsuccessful uh, game offensively can yield some statistical results that seem good, high yardage, high points scored, however, high turnovers, uh, low time of possession if you need to milk the clock. And as a result, you're putting your defense in really bad situations. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're losing games 55 to 49 um, instead of winning them 17 to 6. Right, right. Um, Whereas us, on the other hand, Iowa and the way – they play could have a game where they have 287 yards of total offense and score 28 points. And it is a very, very good offensive game. We huddle up, we go slow, we come up to the line of scrimmage, we snap the ball with seven seconds on the play clock. We huddle up again. We're <laughs> choking the clock. We're sh- we're shrinking the sample size, if you will. We're speeding up the game, which historically has allowed Iowa to play in really close games with UNI and Western Michigan, but also Ohio State, Penn State. And you know Michigan, yeah, historically, right. uh, hasn't been the case in the last few years. But that's the style in which they're playing, and and I'll be the first to point out, like like I said, they have not been doing. That. Like I'm not I'm not trying to gaslight and say like, oh, they've actually been doing pretty well on offense because they don't actually have to get yards and score points to be good on offense. That's <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. They've not been good on offense in, in recent memory. But that is one thing that I, I think that a lot of people miss and is that you have a holistic philosophy as a football team. And a lot of that is dictated by the talent that you can um, reliably gather on your team, uh, what your team makeup looks like, and the type of games that you want to get into. You know, Iowa prides themselves you know, historically on being very, very clean disciplined so so they're right at home in those one score games they're right at home where you know in those games where hey whoever has the fewest penalties and doesn't turn the ball over is going to end up winning this game by four points and we're on to the next one 
you know, hopefully that, that, and that's just one example. And hopefully that was coherent. Um, no, no, it makes, it makes, did that make sense? sense? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think it, 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 it kind of gets lost, you know, in, especially with a lot of the rule changes recently in football, mostly in the NFL that has really maddenized for lack of a better term, what we think of high level football, because we think that everybody should be able to do what Mahomes and Brady and the Mike Leach offenses do, where they just march down, you know, in every two and a half minutes for a score. But to your point, the holistic philosophy of of kind of a, a three tiered football game of controlling the clock on offense, having a great you know bend but don't break defense, and then having great special teams every game. That is the Ferentz model. But if one of those things collapses, then you can have some ugly football along with it. Now, what what I think yeah. I heard from you is is sometimes the Mike Leach stuff can be ugly as well, but fans at least like the points on the scoreboard. Even if it's ugly, even if they're getting their butts kicked, at least there's 35 points on the scoreboard that we can say, well, you know, we've got a little talent on offense that we can build behind. What fans don't want to see is when, you know, you have the the conservative football and, and, you know, you have a couple of injuries on offense like I was experiencing this year. Then all of a sudden you're left with something that looks pretty ugly if if the offense isn't doing well. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. You know, I do think there's a strong preferential bias um, to the to the quote. I, I hate that phrase, uh, but to the casual football fan towards offense. Uh, I I think it's pretty uncontroversial, and this is something I've thought about a little bit over the last couple of years. Pretty uncontroversial thing for me to say that, you know, if Iowa was winning slash losing games. 56 to 49. I don't think we would hear as many boos in Kinnick Stadium. I don't think we'd be call, you know, have as many people calling for the head of the, the, the winningest head coach in, in program history. I don't, I, I think that there would be a very different sentiment. Even if you hold the actual end results constant, if you just flipped um, offense and defense in terms of, you know, 100% perceived perceived oh. output. And, and the problem with Iowa's offensive philosophy, it, you know, and we mentioned you know, every, every OC has, has <laughs> kind of felt this. The problem with their offensive philosophy as it pertains to like, you know, success in the court of public opinion is it's ugly when it works. <laughs> and, and that, you know, to, to the, to the casual football fan that like you mentioned Mahomes and Brady and all those, that's pretty, that's, that's cool. That's fun. Um, and, and I love watching those guys too. Um, but I, I would add that, I think, to the, the what do what do most people miss or, or fail to to acknowledge or or even acknowledge but discount, maybe, that even when it works, it's pretty darn ugly. Even a good Iowa offense, you're probably gonna rank, you're not gonna be 132 in total offense. You're probably gonna be somewhere in the 80s. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're probably going to be somewhere in the 80s just because of style of play, just right. because of pace of play, things like that. And I mean, shoot, I think if you even go back to the Brad Banks, Dallas Clark, Robert Gallery, you know, uh, Freddie Russell days, I don't think they ever cracked the top 10 in total yards in the country. Well, and then even then, no. you know, the the style of football more resembled what Iowa's style was at that time, too. Sure. Yeah. Like, you know, what? like I was kind of still playing that same style of football where everybody else has kind of sold their soul for the sake of offense, for better or worse. Right. Some of it has been extremely innovative and people have had huge successes with it. And some of it like programs went that route and have never recovered. Yeah. And, and you know, again, that to some degree, uh, coaching at this level is obviously extremely lucrative. <laughs> I mean, there's no, everyone knows what power five football coaches make. Uh, it's highly competitive and it really turns into in some respects, a popularity contest. And, you know, the, the person making the hiring decisions is also a person. And most people don't want to, uh, to hire or keep employed Somebody who who uh, you know plays this style of football, even if it translates to wins, and you know the, the 
example that pops into my mind is uh, Paul Christ at University of Wisconsin. I mean, Wisconsin was really, really good under Christ. I mean, very, I mean, Wisconsin in a lot of ways under Christ is everything that Iowa football wanted to be. Right. Uh, and they won a lot of games and had a lot of success. One of the, one of the best programs in the nation through the 2010s. Um, you know, but they ran the ball about 75% of the time. They use a fullback way more than Iowa's ever used a fullback. They got two tight ends out there. And, uh, it was kind of a time capsule offense. Um, and uh, yeah, it just wasn't, wasn't uh, appealing to the eye, uh, to, to the, the casual fan. And, you know, first, first excuse they had to fire him, they did, you know, but a um, little bit off on a tangent there, but yeah, no, there's no yeah. question. It is definitely a little bit of a time capsule. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Brady, I, I appreciate this. I, I know I, I told you 30 minutes and we've, we've gone 45 here, but man, I, I really appreciate your kind of level-headed takes on on football and also kind of your role uh within the program and and your development your story too so i really appreciate you coming on the pod man this has been really fun yeah no thanks for having me tim appreciate it have a good weekend hey you too man and uh i guess go hawks like how do you watch football i guess my last question for you is you know like you watch the hawks as a former former player were you more maniacal about your Hawk fandom before you played for the Hawks or are you more crazy about it now because you're so close to the program? You know, I think, I think being, you know, I was actually leaving Kinnick on Saturday um, thinking this and, and it's something I've, I've said before, but when you're, when you've experienced things like they experienced on Saturday, I've never experienced something quite like that, a game just straight up being stolen from you uh, by the, the officials. But um, that's not all it was. But, yeah, when, when you've experienced things like that uh, from within the walls, I do think it it makes it easier to stomach when you're outside of the walls just because you realize how much it really does suck <laughs> for them. Right. And, and, yeah, and you, exactly. you realize – and that's another thing, I, you know, I guess we – you mentioned what, what the fans don't understand is that, you know, like I promise you when you're upset and feeling bad about a loss, <laughs> uh, I can promise you that uh, those players would give anything to only feel how sick you do. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not point. even, it, it, it's not even close. I mean, it's imagine going in back into the facility on Sunday morning and you can, hear a pin drop, um, you know, like you're at a funeral or something. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's not the same thing. So, so yeah, I, I go to games, we have season tickets. Um, and, and I thank God that not every fan in Kinnick stadium, uh, watches the game like I do because you'd be able to hear a pin drop, you know, mm. <laughs> uh, I, I watch it kind of like Bill Belichick, um, watches his games from the sideline. I mean, there's, there's no real emotion. I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at things probably most fans aren't. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely want them to succeed, but not much emotion uh, for me, at least uh, watching those games. Most of the time, I just, uh, I don't know. I want to say been there, done that, but it's just, it's different for sure. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, once again, going back, you know, very few people have experienced that and you're, you know, one of the great minority in Kinnick stadium that has that experience of, of being close to that locker room and knowing what it's like on the inside. So Brady, I appreciate you sharing your insight with, with the podcast and uh, hopefully, you know, next time I'm in Fort Dodge or Northern Iowa, we get a chance to run into each other. Yeah, Tim, absolutely. It's Moonlight Graham. Yeah. It's a pretty, Broadcasting to the heartland Sports stories for the every man It's Moonlight Graham, yeah Please follow us on Instagram You're loving us 
us on Twitter too. You download every part we do. It's Moonlight Graham.